Hello, everyone. I think we have very good traction today. I see very familiar names. Thank you very much for joining us today in Marquez House Views 2022 webinar. Uh, it's titled Navigating the Markets. To introduce myself, my name is Abdul Latif Al Nasaf. I'm the Managing Director at Marquez. I oversee wealth, international equities, business development, and uh, media. So in today's session, we will be looking at opportunities and challenges across the GCC and global markets for 2022. And I must admit 2021 was a very interesting year. Marquez recorded positive performance for the first nine months. We're talking about 13.8 million KD in profits, something we haven't seen in some time, uh, with also 29 fills earnings per share. So we are looking forward to a promising 2022. Uh, now, uh, I'm gonna go through different asset classes within Marquez. So with Mina Equities, for example, our largest department here with an AUM of about 615 million KD. Uh, we have two flagship funds, one of which recorded 28% uh, uh, year to date. Uh, ending 2021, uh, which is our MIDAF fund. And then our Islamic fund also achieved about 25% year to date for that same year. Uh, moving on to international equities, international real estate, sorry. We've had an amazing year, weighted average return for international real estate. Products that we exited last year were about 30% uh, IRR on average, which is not normal. I mean, we've had short short tenor uh, big products uh, but the performance has been exceptional our research team has done a splendid job we've had a very productive year with more than 15 mandates uh, across different institutions uh, and this is predominantly our research arm uh, marmor in chennai india um, and for uh, MENA real estate also, uh, we're talking about an AUM of 290 million KD across different, uh, different uh, regions uh, with their flagship fund, Marcus Real Estate uh, Fund, which, uh, which generates an income uh, of about 5% uh, yearly distributed monthly, one of the largest open-ended real estate products uh, on the market. If we move on to capital markets also, it's been a great year. We have transaction value of about 180 million KD. The team has done uh, uh, phenomenal with issuances and uh, uh, capital increases across, uh, across Kuwait and uh, the region. So um, also in terms of achievements, I think in today's papers, you would have noticed we've, we've been recognized with more than five awards for 2021, uh, presented by leading financial institutions. So uh, this is also something uh, to mention. So it's a great way to end 2021 and also a great way to welcome the new one. Uh, now moving on to our webinar today, I'll briefly go through the agenda to introduce the speakers and then hand over to our first presentation. So we have different speakers from different countries. Raghu, who's talking to us from Chennai in the our office there, he's the CEO of uh, Marmor Mean Intelligence, uh, who will be setting the macro context for the global and the regional economy. Then we're going to move on to Mohammed Abdul Qadir, the Vice President of Mina Equities, um, who will talk about uh, Kuwait and regional market outlook when it comes to equities. And then Khalid Mubarak, he was also Vice President in Mina Real Estate. Uh, he's going to shed light on uh, MENA real estate outlook. And then last but not least, from London, Christopher Santiago, Assistant Vice President in International Real Estate, will share his views on international real estate market, both U.S. and Europe. We've been doing U.S. real estate since the 80s, one of the oldest companies here in Kuwait that does U.S. real estate. Uh, so we've been doing this for some time now. Uh, now for Q&A, uh, we're going to do that towards the end, so feel free to type your questions, and I'm going to take them, and uh, towards the end, uh, we're going to address those. Thank you for making the time to listen. Uh, I'm going to leave now, uh, hand it over to Raghu, CEO of Marmor Mean Intelligence. So, Raghu, the floor is yours.
Thank you, Abdul Latif, for that um, kind introduction and a very good overview of Marcus that you gave. Uh, welcome, all of you. Good evening. Salam alaikum. It's always a pleasure uh, talking to all of you. Um, I'm going to be uh, giving uh, an overarching big picture view of uh, both the global markets and the regional markets. Uh, of course, we had a great uh, 2021, but we are stepping into a very volatile 2022. So that is the context in which I'm going to be discussing. Let me uh, share my presentation. Hope you can see it. Yeah. So what we expect in 2022, that's the theme. Uh, there are um, the good, bad, and uncertain. We'll quickly um, look at them. So uh, of course, 2020 started as a year of Corona and then 2021 uh, witnessed uh, lockdowns and rebounds, but um, it was definitely a much better year compared to 2020 where markets reached their lows uh, in March. So 2021 has been a great year for the global markets and the regional market, but not without um, news and events that really looked like a roller coaster ride. So uh, we've been uh, you know, hearing a lot about the COVID's uh, various avatars and the vaccination drives. Uh, we also had a European gas crisis and uh, we had supply chain issues. Uh, of course, uh, the topic on inflation is an ongoing topic even today. And uh, you know, uh, we know that the Fed is um, increasing the interest rates. And in this environment, uh, we also had a very good uh, oil price. So uh, it's, it's a lot of things going on. And that's when the navigating the financial landscape became very challenging. Here is the table that talks about the global asset class performance. Um, curiously, you can see Bitcoins also entering as a major asset class. Of course, it's the most volatile. You can see some months where it topped the chart and some months where uh, I just went to the bottom. But ignoring uh, that, uh, we had a great uh, you know, uh, equity market performance globally. Uh, S&P 500, MSA World uh, did very well, especially MSA World right in the middle, providing the benefit of diversification. Of course, the bonds were uh, not doing well as expected, but um, you know, equities had an extremely, extremely good run in 2021. The question of global growth um, is, is a very interesting one. We all know that 2020 was a, a negative year from a GDP perspective, thanks to Corona. And 2021 was a rebound year where almost all major economies, including US, UK, Germany, France, Japan, they had a very big uh, rebound thanks to the uh, low base. And uh, how does 2022 look according to IMF? They look, uh, you know, again, another year of rebound. The rebound continues in 2022. So IMF is penciling good growth for US, UK and other markets. So it's going to be an year where economic growth is going to be one of the important themes to look at. Uh, on the back of this and on the back of uh, increased interest rates from Fed, uh, we have very mixed views on asset class from global investment banks. So uh, obviously the uh, confusion uh, levels are very high for US equities. Uh, we, we have positives like the economic growth, the earnings growth and supply chain normalizing, but we also have uh, high valuations and uh, higher volatility to contend with. Already uh, 2022 so far has been very bad for US equities and global equities, but uh, investment banks uh, are suggesting overweight for non-US equities on the back of lower valuation. Uh, they are uh, more prone towards cyclical equities, uh, not much on technology, but uh, definitely uh, 
banks will benefit when interest rates increases. So those are uh, some of the overweight and underweight options. Curiously enough, emerging market corporate bonds have been consistently touted to be a good opportunity by investment banks. Of course, commodities are good in a higher inflationary regime. And within commodities, I think oil looks very strong at the moment. We're going to see uh, some dedicated uh, views on oil towards the end, but uh, this is the interest rate hike remains the biggest risk for 2022 and beyond. Uh, as you can uh, see in the chart, interest rates have stayed near zero for a very, very long time, which probably explains the, the huge performance of uh, uh, asset markets. But the uh, Fed is now worried about inflation and therefore they are already indicating at least the three phases in 2022. Um, analysts are expecting a total of about 75 bips for 2022 and another 75 bips for 2023. But uh, there are analysts who also expect more in 2022 if inflation becomes a very, um, uh, uncontrollable risk from the Fed's point of view. So as interest rates uh, go up, uh, that is going to uh, probably be a big uh, negative for equity markets. And uh, <clears throat> there are, at the moment, we have several known unknowns, as I might call. So uh, we know uh, COVID keeps coming back uh, as waves. So it doesn't stop yet. And uh, we still aren't sure about the efficiency of vaccination against new variants. And uh, there is this big question about uh, high inflation. Is inflation a transitory problem or is it uh, going to be sticking around for a while, which will open up very, very different policy options. And uh, all this will lead to uh, enormous uh, policy options before central banks. And if they make some missteps that can extremely be costly. And uh, throughout 2020 and 21, uh, global economies faced a huge supply chain and labor shortages. So uh, the big question in 2022 is, uh, will we see these uh, uh, bottlenecks easing as we move into the year? So answers to these unknowns would definitely determine the uh, overall macro context for global markets. Of course, uh, we are very much in the region and uh, we manage uh, money in the local market. So here is the view on the GCC market. As you can see, GCC had a roaring year in 2021, especially Abu Dhabi, which was up by nearly 68%. Uh, but GCC Composite Index has been the second best performer at about 31% and uh, with very little volatility. And then you have Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Kuwait, almost everyone doing extremely well on the back of very good oil price. So uh, in the region, we had very high vaccination rates. <laughs> we had lockdowns and lifting of lockdowns and uh, several reforms have been initiated and high oil price means low uh, budget deficits, which means uh, lower uh, you know, raising of uh, debt in the sovereign market actually. And uh, since most of our GCC currencies are pegged to the US dollar, uh, we sort of import the inflation. So inflation also is a problem for GCC as long as it remains a US problem. From a growth perspective, uh, like the global markets, uh, even the GCC economies um, are experiencing an extremely good rebound. But uh, you know, relative to the fall that they had in 2020, the rebound in 2021 has been mild. And therefore, 2022 promises to be a very strong year from an economic rebound perspective. So apart from very good outlook for oil, uh, which obviously translates into uh, economic growth. Uh, the call by IMF on the GDP growth for GCC countries has, has been quite uh, robust as of now for 2022. This means that uh, the fiscal uh, deficit, which has been a big problem uh, in the past, especially in 2020, you can see in this chart how deep the fiscal deficits have been. But uh, right now uh, for 2021 and uh, 2022, uh, except for Bahrain and to an extent uh, Saudi Arabia, 
uh, most of the GCC economies would not have any deficits, uh, deficits to uh, contend with. The uh, most important aspect is, of course, oil. Uh, oil increased by nearly 50% in uh, 2021. That's been the best performance since 2016. According to the current scenario, this momentum could very well carry into 2022. The OPEC is keeping a very tight leash on the uh, supply and uh, the demand will definitely pick up once the global uh, economic growth rebounds. And uh, lack of um, you know, investments in capacity expansion definitely will uh, keep the prices uh, you know, very good. And therefore, very simply from a demand supply perspective, uh, I think oil is in a very sweet spot. So uh, if you can see here, the price forecast by various agencies uh, range between uh, $72 to 125 on the, uh, the low and the high side, but the truth can be somewhere in between. But uh, suffice to say that uh, the oil price calls for 2022 is way, way higher than the oil price required by GCC economies to balance the budget, what is called as the fiscal break-even oil price. Except for uh, Bahrain, all other uh, countries have an ask or, uh, or need an oil price far lower than what it is currently. So that's a very good uh, thing to look at. So that concludes my presentation. So I have uh, given the macro context uh, both the, for the global and the regional economies. Uh, to sum it up, it's going to be a rebound year and it's going to be a year where interest rates are going to go up. Uh, inflation will definitely be very high. Oil price will continue to be strong and therefore GCC um, economies and the markets can continue to remain uh, uh, look positive from an outlook perspective. With this, uh, I will close my presentation and I must thank all of you for patiently listening to me. And I'm happy to take questions towards the end. Uh, now I will uh, give the floor to Mohammed Abdul Qadir, uh, Vice President from Mena Equities. He will uh, walk you through about the outlook for the Kuwait stock market. Okay. Over to you, Mohammed. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody, and welcome in joining us. Uh, today, we'll, we'll be talking in the, about the Kuwait market outlook. To start with, the past year, Kuwait has witnessed a, a significant positive performance last year, uh, as the indices has closed uh, at roughly 30% return for 2021. Uh, Kuwait, if looking at the uh, relative performance for the within, within regional and global market, Kuwait stand out in terms of performance, outperforming both the MSCI Emerging Market, MSCI Develop, and the uh, uh, most regional uh, most regional uh, markets. Unlike the 2019, the current the last year performance has been broad based with both premier and main market. Uh, driving the uh, index up. And the good thing also that has been uh, seen across the last couple of years is the uh, continuing increasing uh, increase in the average daily traded value. Before 2021, uh, the average daily traded value stand out 56% as can be seen uh, from the chart. This has two positive uh, with it. First of all, we top the last year figure, which includes the uh, inclusion of the uh, huge inclusion of MS MSCI uh, index, which attracted a lot of passive flows. And uh, also that is the consistent in the in this chart, as we can see, it, it, the, it also continue to in, in be backed the look, I mean, the average daily traded value continue to be backed by foreign investor, which has been uh, uh, now a permanent uh, trader in, in our market, roughly averaging around 25% to 30% in the last couple of years. And the last year, the, the, their participation has only been decreased by a huge increase from local investors, as both retail and companies and clients account has, has witnessed a significant increase, translating the, into an, an, a, the higher investment uh, investor confidence in the market. Now, going into the operating environment, as we can see from the chart, 
so far the com the companies in the is listed in the stock exchange has has been living in what we call an anemic growth environment where it's it's been lacking on the uh, major economic activities front where things has been almost stagnant for for the last couple of years the uh, compounded annual growth rate in revenue for the last six years is 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 a mere three percent which is is, is a very low figure uh, trying to explain or you know, explaining the, uh, the current environment where an external catalyst has to happen for, for the overall economic activity of the listed companies to, 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 be, to shift to the next gear. Uh, unfortunately, that is also primarily driven by banking sector, which, has a, which, which averaged around 4%. But if we look at the non-bank sector, the, sto the story is a bit weaker at below 3% compounded annual growth for the last six years. This has translated into a weaker, uh, weaker bottom line growth, uh, and the only better growth is seen because of the decline in provision in the banking sector. But all in all, the non-banking the non-banking stocks has has seen their net income decline by 0.8 percent compound annually in the in the last uh, six years. This is a reflection of the uh, of the current environment that. A sort of mature maturity level for the companies uh, in the in the in the stock exchange. Uh, more on that front, if we this is the chart explaining the or showing the uh, credit growth in this in the system. As we can see, the total growth has been averaging around five percent. If we look into the component of that growth, we could see that is primarily driven by personal growth or retail loan growth, and that is also a function of the higher salaries that have been a couple of years back and also the uh, deferral of payment which has which give more room for a uh, uh, short-term boost in, in borrowing capacity for the uh, retail sector on the other hand corporate corporate demand has been weak averaging at three percent the in the last five to six years now this is also a direct reflection of of the uh, weakening or slowdown in the project award as we see in Kuwait where 14, 15, and 2016 has witnessed some sort of improvement in the project award. We, we, the project award has slowed down since then. And that is why we, and that has been a, a major drag on the corporate performance, generally speaking, in Kuwait. Uh, going into the valuation, as we can see from the chart, Kuwait market is trading at a very rich valuation. The forward PE for the market standing at 19 times expected earnings, while the average for the past years has been 15.6. And also the market has been, has also is trading above the one standard deviation, giving that to me, believing in the MER version that also could, could indicating that the market is trading a bit on the higher side. Also the trading PE, Print the sim similar picture to the overall valuation scenario in the, in, in the Kuwait Stock Exchange. As we can see, that the fundamentals doesn't look good, but the market is slightly running ahead of the fundamentals uh, so far in the last two years would be uh, positive gains. Uh, if we look into the what the analysts are expecting for Kuwait market, the uh, cu currently the analyst covering stocks in Kuwait is as, as around 2022 uh, names that represent north of 70% both in, of, in terms of market cap and the total earning of the market. The, currently they are trading at a market cap of 31 billion, but if we take the, the valuation of, of the analyst for these names, the market has a downside of 14%. In another, in another world, market currently trading ahead of its, its uh, uh, what the analysts are assigning as fair values for it. Uh, that's, has to be driven by some sort of weaker or weak expected profit for the market. As you can see, the post-COVID recovery is only expected to, to hit in, in in 2023, while 2022, we're kind of uh, at a very, very shy, of, little shy of the uh, 2019 level. So all in all, the, uh, the analyst or the consensus is not really printing, uh, portraying a very good picture for the uh, Kuwait market. Now, time for the good news is, as we can see that the market is uh, going ahead of the fundamentals, 
as we say, but we think that is uh, uh, justified and that is uh, the market is trying to price a, a major uh, positive development that, that is happening now within the uh, Kuwait economy. Starting with is the higher oil prices, which has which, is, uh, which represents sort of a magic number for the economy, as it can start from uh, balancing the government budget, enabling the, uh, uh, them to uh, allocate more money into the capex or the capital spending, and trickling down all the way into the uh, investor uh, uh, sentiment and uh, consumer confidence. Uh, second is the mortgage law, which is uh, a major development that has been lacking in the market uh, since, uh, since the 2008 uh, 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 financial crisis. Now, we, had, we never seen something, um, an economic development that would result in a massive, massive uh, improvement in the, in the economy that would be also, uh, and the most important, it would be inclusive of a lot of listed sectors in, in the Kuwait Stock Exchange starting from the banks, going to the uh, building materials and uh, also the real estate developers and uh, would, would have a massive and broad-based impact on the, uh, for the market. Uh, then the project spending, which expected to accelerate in the coming uh, years, uh, driven by a strategic need for uh, spending in the oil sector and also the infrastructure. And uh, last is the... Uh, the current situation would be easing on the financing of the government. Uh, we think that is uh, there is a higher or better pos possibility for approval of debt law, which has been hanging uh, around for a, for a couple of months now, maybe more, in, in uh, with the parliament. And there there is a political uh, con uh, concession is needed on, on that. Uh, now we think that with with the current oil prices, so the government need would be lower and would be easier to approve. Uh, a debt load. Also, foreign investor and rating agency would have the, would take it, you know, it's, it's been hanging with them, the debt load, so that would be also very good for the uh, investor confidence, in the foreign investor confidence and the uh, Kuwait outlook in terms of uh, rating. And uh, last, also the uh, market development that is happening. Uh, we've seen some pickup in, in, in sort of uh, uh, secondary drivers, but we still believe that this should also add or contribute to the uh, positive performance for Kuwait. Uh, the uh, many, many listing that is in the pipeline now and the Borsa Kuwait effort to introduce different type of tools that should improve the trading uh, overall and a lot of positive development on the, com on the company specific level, especially, <clears throat> sorry, especially interest rate where uh, to benefit largely would benefit the banking sector, which is the largest sector in, in uh, representing in the uh, in the exchange, and also uh, a lot of different companies that has that is witnessing a positive development, which accordingly we are positioned now taking advantage of this development in our uh, fund uh, and portfolio. So to wrap up, uh, the message is Kuwait market now is trading at rich valuation, but we feel it's justified discounting all of these facts and we still that believe that these are major things that would really uh, underlie uh, the foundation for a sustainable growth in the medium to long term. Uh, just to shed now finally to shed some light on the uh, importance of the uh, mortgage law. Now the government is, is planning to distribute around 90,000 units uh, uh, till 2031. The current outstanding the, uh, demand for housing is around 91,000 units. So in, in two, 10 years time, we'll, we'll almost be just covering the current outstanding shortage. Now, the, uh, that if, assuming just that, that should add to 30% to the overall system loan growth at an annual rate of 3%, which, which should be significant, but looking into deeper into that, this would also in, in, in incorporate a better scenario where, as we can see in this chart, that the majority of the uh, population is just below the age of 29. That should be uh, expected to add into the housing demand annually going forward. So the favorable demographics just ensure that the housing shortage would remain for the uh, foreseeable, foreseeable future. And uh, at last, the, 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 this 
chart is the presenting the annual number of marriages in Kuwait. So that is an, uh, the expected annual increase in housing demand overall. So we're expecting around 10 to 11,000 marriage per year that should translate into uh, demand for housing. Now, look, the overall government plan is to, to build around 200,000 units, but we don't know the time, time uh, for it. So just assuming that, that the 200,000 units should be delivered by the government to meet the demand till 2031, that would translate into 70% growth in, in loan book for the banks. So the mortgage is some is, is very significant development that is happening that would almost double the uh, loan book for the uh, banking sector. And if we can see the uh, Saudi, uh, we can take the Saudi experience that has been a very, very well, a very successful product in terms of both the consumer demand and the impact on the stock price. And uh, overall, that would be the, uh, the end of this presentation and we'll, we'll have you to take question at the end of it. Thank you. And I'll hand over now to Mr. Khalid. Uh, Mohammed, before you hand over, I'd like to touch on an important topic you mentioned, which Please. was capitalizing on returns uh, that you've mentioned through funds. And I also know that you guys, uh, uh, you've worked with mass customizations with portfolios with a minimum of 100,000 KD where you've been able to capture tremendous returns through uh, opportunistic portfolios or high conviction that have a small selection of stocks which are slightly more risky but offer clients uh, great opportunities to maximize uh, returns. So just a small caveat here to add before you uh, hand over to Khalid. Thank you. Yes, as, 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 you, as you mentioned, at the Latif, we have different products that is catered to different needs of the client, depending on their, on their risk profile needs. And uh, we also provide stable, stable dividend portfolio where an, 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 an a, a annual or period, periodic uh, district cash distribution is, is given to client out of their uh, portfolios. So, uh, and we've been successful and we've seen a lot of interest uh, in our appetite from investors for our new product that is, uh, uh, we, we believe it's uh, are unique within the offering of the uh, local market. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everybody. This is Khaled Mubariki from MENA Real Estate Department. Today I will be covering the MENA Real Estate 2022 outlook. To start with, we're going to focus on Kuwait market, UAE, and Saudi Arabia market. Starting with the starting with Kuwait market, as for Kuwait macroeconomic views, uh, we believe that the oil GDP growth will be strong for the year 2022, uh, driven by the rebound in the oil prices, uh, which had a very strong recovery in the recent quarters. Uh, the non-oil GDP growth is expected to be, to have a moderate outlook. The fiscal balance as a percentage of GDP is expected to have a moderate outlook, uh, driven by the oil prices, which is expected to, to reduce the pressure uh, on the revenue side in Kuwait. As for investment, we believe it will be neutral uh, in 2022. Uh, this is due to the governmental uh, expenditure, which is mainly focusing on wages and salaries uh, in the public sector. Uh, therefore, it is not it is not clear it is not clear uh, the capital expenditure that the government will spend on infrastructure uh, infrastructure project. As for the money supply, inflation, the yearly population growth, and the job creation, uh, the outlook for 2022 is expected to be neutral in Kuwait. Uh, moving on to the Kuwait real estate market, as an outlook, uh, we believe that the the real estate market uh, is currently recovering especially in the previous uh, two quarters. And currently we have bottomed out and we are currently in the way and the path of the recovery. Uh, the, disrup the disruption of COVID-19 pandemic uh, is expected to smoothen in the near uh, term due to rapid vaccination in Kuwait. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the consumer spending have improved in 2021. 
uh, the, there was an increase of 22.7% in POS, ATM, and online transactions in Kuwait in Q3 2021 compared to Q3 2019. Uh, this growth su suggests that uh, people are more focusing on, 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 on the transactions here in Kuwait. Uh, in addition, Kuwait has a very young population, uh, which will also uh, help the demand in Kuwait for, real, for the real estate sector on the long run. Uh, as for investment sector in Kuwait and the real estate market, uh, which is mainly dependent on expatriates, uh, it was weakened since 2015 due to the fall of oil prices. In addition to the squeeze of the governmental budget in the past few years, uh, the COVID-19 had a major effect on the real estate market, especially the residential sector in Kuwait, uh, which led to a reduction in the number of expats here in Kuwait. Uh, this, this sector, we believe that it is highly dependent on the governmental policies, especially with the talks of balancing out the population in Kuwait, in addition to any new governmental projects in the pipeline. As my colleague Mohammed uh, touched on the Kuwait draft mortgage law, we believe that the mortgage law is really important and uh, hopefully it will be approved in 2022, which will drive demand for the real estate, real estate sector in Kuwait. Uh, finally, for Kuwait, we believe that the valuation will be stable in the investment sector and the commercial sector during 2022 with a minimal upward movement. And this is mainly depending on the asset class and location of the real estate. As a matter of fact, we at Marquez, uh, we are exposed to the, to, to, Kuwait market, to the Kuwait real estate market through our fund, Marquez Real Estate Fund, uh, which is an Sharia compliant open-ended fund uh, investing purely in Kuwait. Uh, moving on to Saudi Arabia real estate market, we're gonna start with the macroeconomic reviews, uh, starting with the old oil GDP growth, the outlook is believed to be strong in 2022. Uh, and uh, as stated previously, this is mainly due to the rebound of uh, the oil prices in the recent quarters. Uh, as for the non-oil GDP growth, it, the outlook is expected to be moderate. Fiscal balance is also expected to be moderate. Uh, and it is expected to improve in 2022 also to, uh, due to the increase of uh, the higher oil prices, uh, which uh, Saudi Arabia announced that they will, they are forecasting a positive uh, surplus in 2022, which is the first since uh, 2014. Moving on to the investments, uh, we believe the outlook will, will be neutral. Uh, the current trends uh, expected to continue in 2022, especially that the government in Saudi Arabia is continuing to, to prioritize the real estate sector. Uh, money supply, population growth, job creation is believed uh, to have a neutral outlook in Saudi Arabia. And finally, inflation is expected to be moderate. Uh, moving on to the real estate market in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, the Saudi Arabia economy witnessed a sharp re rebound, registering uh, uh, an increase of 7% in Q3 in the real GDP, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is mainly due to the to, to the increase in oil prices. Uh, the governmental spend, uh, spending on various infrastructure projects uh, is an important uh, key point in Saudi Arabia Vision 2030. Uh, and it is expected to have the, to, to, to provide the, uh, the, mom, the positive momentum in the non-oil sectors also. Uh, as stated, the oil prices is expected to, to to, to remain high uh, and is expected to be over than, more than $70 per barrel in 2022. Uh, the, the increase in oil prices would give uh, the uh, government in Saudi Arabia uh, the cushion uh, which, will, which will be reflected uh, on the Saudi uh, economic outlook. Uh, the real estate prices in Saudi Arabia is is, is stabilizing and uh, it has been recovered in the, in the previous quarters, especially in the past two quarters in 2021. Uh, and it is expected to, to continue uh, in the upward trend. 
the Saudi Arabia real estate market, uh, uh, the current recovery is, is, is driven by, 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 by the condition happening in Saudi Arabia, in addition to the governmental uh, policies, uh, such as having uh, uh, Saudis owning their own homes uh, and mandating regional headquarters uh, for foreign companies to be located in Saudi Arabia. Uh, as initiative, the government of Saudi Arabia uh, introduced Sekani and Wafi. Sekani is enabling Saudis uh, to citizens to, to own their first home, while Wafi is an off-sale, uh, off-plan sale uh, and rent program, which will boost and drive the real estate sector in Saudi Arabia. Uh, based on that, uh, we believe that the, that the real estate market is expected to accelerate in 2022. Uh, and uh, to have the valuation uh, increasing during uh, 2022. Uh, and this is also depending on the asset class and location of the assets. Uh, we at Marquez, we are exported to the Saudi Arabia market through our fund, MGRF, Marquez Gulf Real Estate Fund, uh, which is an open-ended fund uh, invest with an exposure of 35% of its assets in Saudi Arabia. Uh, finally, we're going to move on to the UAE real estate market, uh, starting with the market economy views. The oil GDP growth is expected to be moderate uh, due to the demand in, uh, due to the global demand on oil, uh, which is expected to, to have a positive impact uh, on UAE economy. Uh, the non-oil GDP growth is its outlook is expected to be neutral in 2022. Fiscal balance is expected to, to, uh, to be moderate, uh, especially of the diminishing government deficits, uh, along with the increasing expenditure, uh, which, which are very positive signs uh, on the economy of the UAE in 2022. As for investments, uh, it is expected that the outlook to be neutral, uh, especially, that UAE are, especially that UAE are taking uh, active measures uh, to facilitate the ease of doing business, which is really important in the UAE. Uh, in, in addition to, to, to having a bigger role of, on the private sector and allowing for the ownership of companies in the UAE. Uh, moving on to the money supply and the job creation, it is about that is expected to be neutral in 2022, while the inflation and uh, the yearly population growth is expected to be moderate in the UAE. Uh, as for the real estate market, the outlook of 2022 suggests that the economy will do well in UAE and will be positive uh, based on the rise of oil prices, uh, the increase in the non-oil sectors, and uh, as you know, the global uh, event, uh, which is uh, uh, Dubai Expo 2020, which will continue uh, until March 22. But we believe that the effect of of uh, Expo 2020 will be realized in 2020, uh, 2022 and the years beyond. Uh, the UAE economy uh, bounced back in 2021, especially that the trade and travel sectors opened up in, in the UAE. Uh, this is helping the real estate market in the UAE. Uh, on the same issue, cons uh, uh, consumer price index infl inflation in UAE has been deflationary since 2019, while we noticed a, a positive turn in uh, August 2021. Having a stable uh, and positive inflationary trend would help uh, boost the real estate sector in the UAE. Uh, target, the targeted government st uh, stimulatory policies also help the private sector, uh, with a big emphasis, uh, especially on the SMEs, uh, increased mortgage lending limits, uh, and the introduction of special visa programs for uh, for, uh, for targeted skilled labor in the UAE, which also would have a positive uh, reflection on the economy and the real estate sector. Uh, in specific, the real estate sector in the UAE had a strong rebound in, in late quarters of 2021, uh, mainly due to the demand in the residential properties uh, in UAE driving up prices. Uh, along with the prices increase, uh, the value of transactions is noticed to increase also. So we noticed it doubled, uh, more than doubled uh, in 2021 compared and rel relative to 2022. As I stated, the benefit of Expo 2020 to the overall economy is, is, is tremendous and will be, uh, will be reflected in 2022 and the years uh, 
later. So the, we, we expect that the overall, uh, the, the, that the overall uh, effect on the real estate sector in the UAE uh, is expected to accelerate, uh, driving the valuations to increase, uh, which also depends uh, also on the asset class and location of the properties. Finally, as I stated, uh, our fund MGREF uh, is also exposed has an uh, has an expo uh, is exposed to the UAE real estate market uh, and with a current allocation of thirty five percent in the UAE. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. Uh, now I leave it for Christopher Santiago. Uh, he's an ADP in the International Real Estate Department. Khalid, before you move on to to Chris, I'd like to also add that. Marcus Real Estate uh, Fund has never defaulted uh, in paying uh, dividends throughout its inception in 2003. So even during COVID, I think you guys did a great job in maintaining uh, the distribution uh, th throughout. Yes, that's correct, I believe. Thank you very much, uh, Khalid. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody um, out here to, who's taking the time off to, uh, to attend this webinar. Uh, my name is Christopher, and I'm here to talk about the international real estate, how Marcus has performed across the assets under management, uh, our historical performance, how real estate is performing across the board, and what is the outlook for 2022? So we at Marcus have always maintained a successful track record, um, providing excellent investment opportunities um, for our investors. And we have secured 48 wins over the last 50 investment products. The two negative returns were, were due to uh, the financial crisis that was back in, in 2007 and 2008. Uh, there have been no foreclosures uh, despite uh, challenging market cycles. And we at Marcus take an oppor opportunistic approach, uh, capitalizing on latest trends across uh, new markets. And we have a diversified regional uh, real estate portfolio. Uh, since in, uh, inception, as you can see on the chart, uh, more than 75% of our investment products have generated a return of, of more than 10% IRR. And 50% 50 of uh, the total transactions have secured more than 15% uh, returns. Now, if you can see, just to reiterate what uh, Mr. Abdul Latif had said in the beginning of, the, of our presentation of the, of the webinar, that uh, we have had a phenomenal year and uh, our trajectory on, uh, went on a weighted average return over the last decade is 18.9%. Is um, if you take it over the last decade, our, our weighted average return. And uh, since inception, it's 13.5%, uh, which uh, just goes to show or just reconfirms that we are on an upward moving trajectory. Uh, the total real estate under management amounts to a little over 800 million US dollars. And uh, during 2021, uh, we have either exited or sold uh, five projects. So one of them in the US and, and the rest are in Europe. and and. Also, in addition to that, we have also invested in 10 projects, uh, three of them in the US and uh, seven in Europe. Moving on to uh, the, just to give you a backdrop of the, uh, the commercial uh, property uh, index and, and how, how it's been performing across the years. Uh, this slide actually sets, indicates how real estate in US and Europe is performing. And against the backdrop of COVID-19, uh, 2020 and 2021, there was actually a decline in the second quarter of 2020. However, the chart indicates that the all property index uh, increased by 24% in, in 2021, uh, with robust uh, price appreciations occurring in every corner of the real estate uh, sector. Now, this increase is actually attributed to the benefit of uncompetitive fixed income yields and uh, rising inflation rates. 
At sector level, uh, the industrial continues to benefit uh, from robust demands and the asset values are, you know, they rose by 25% in that industrial or logistic sector. But this is in stark contrast to what uh, we have seen in, in retail and hospitality as uh, investors just uh, continue to take a, a wait and see approach. Moving on to the next slide is inflation and uh, spreads over uh, risk-free rates. Uh, firstly, I'd like to touch upon um, inflation. Now, we can see that inflation has uh, reached a multi-decade high uh, in, in US and in Europe. And when, this is mainly due to the strong economic growth, uh, the labor shortages, and the staggered uh, supply chain. And this will be elevated during the first half of 2022, but uh, this could be just by 2.5%, as we can see that there is uh, uh, stability uh, in the economic growth and fewer uh, supply chains constraints. Uh, there is likely to be no sharp uh, interest rates enough to disrupt the, the property market. Now, when it comes to cap rates or yields over risk-free rates, the chart on the slide indicates a spread over risk-free rates is narrowing, but significant. And we expect uh, real estate spreads to remain wide by historical standards. Uh, this is helping to offset the impact of, of rising interest rates. We can also see that the old property cap rates now are around 280 to 300 BIPs, uh, uh, points higher than the 10-year the, the uh, treasury bonds. And this is actually almost in line with what we have seen trends during 2013 and 2018. Moving on to uh, the, uh, the, core, the core assets, uh, real estate assets. So, now we, we can see what we can see in the, the office market. So uh, overall, the sentiments in the, in the office sector, the, act, the activities across the office market, across the globe are improving by 39%. Uh, however, the global leasing volumes are actually 25% lower than pre-COVID levels. And, and this is highly, uh, highly dense offices have actually mostly been affected. And, and we can see that, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. is lagging the most with uh, a negative 31 percent, followed by Europe minus 26 percent, and and then the APAC region, which is the least, of minus four uh, percent. Moving on to the logistics sector. Now, the logistics sector have fared uh, very well uh, during 2021. And uh, we can see an upward trend in, in rental change. So if you take a global average, it's about 4.5% increase in, in, in rental growth rates. Uh, in, in the US, uh, operators have all experienced increased increase demand accounting to over around 28% of the total leasing volume, which was recorded in, in Q3, 2021. In Europe, uh, 2022 is expected to, to break records as we can actually see that the supply is struggling to keep up with demand and uh, vacancies have actually recorded an historic low of 3.8%. Moving on to the multi-family housing sector. The multi-family uh, multi housing sector maintains its, its status uh, and is the most liquid asset type in the US market um, in, in uh, Q3 2021. And as we can see from the chart, uh, capital increasingly targets multi-housing. So in 2011, it's, it was around 29%. In 2015, it moved up to 32%. Just before COVID hit, it was 38%. And in 2021, it moved up to 45%. Taking a look at uh, hotels and the hospitality sector. Now this has been the uh, the hospitality sector has been the, needless to say has been the most affected uh, since since COVID nineteen. Uh, the recovery continues to to favor uh, leisure resort destinations with urban markets gradually seeing green shoots in in performances. Uh, in in the US, the ref bar levels recorded in August from year to date uh, was just seventy seven percent of 
what was recorded in 2019. In Europe, hotel occupancy is, in, is in improving across the major European cities. How, uh, this is followed by uh, the vaccination programs and, and you know, the lifting of uh, uh, restrictions, but they have actually remained uh, an occupancy level of between 20 to 36% range. The retail sector, global markets are recovering at various rates. Now this is highly dependent on the each country's COVID situations, the economic conditions and the expected re uh, returns from international investors. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and visitors. The leasing activities continue to pick up uh, in, a, in many major retail uh, markets, but prime, uh, with prime space highly sought after in countries with high vaccination rates. Uh, recovery in, in leasing activity is continue to lag uh, in markets that are largely dependent on international tourism and spending. Now, what is the impact uh, of the current outlook for 2022? Tradi uh, we can see that traditional growth sectors are declining uh, with, with COVID uh, accelerating growth in emerging and fast growing sectors such as uh, the data centers and uh, the distribution uh, facilities. There is uh, rising construction costs. There is uh, supply chain disruptions. There are labor skill shortages. Uh, which are quickly becoming more significant, uh, significant barriers to the industry growth. The year 2022 is optimistic yet cautious for the, the construction industry. As activities accelerate, the supply chain constraints increase and uh, skill shortages worsen, results in a, sustain, a substantial construction cost inflation in, in many markets. But uh, we can see that with the rise in material costs, this is likely to slow down a development, creating a very favorable supply side dynamics. Moving on to the outlook for each of the real estate asset class. Indust the, the industrial or the logistics sector, it's, it's res been resilient to, to COVID-19 uh, impacts uh, due to the e-commerce uh, factors. The net absorption are projected to outpace historical uh, annual averages. Rental growth is expected to continue uh, in 2022, uh, feeding of existing demand. The multifamily uh, sector, class A was hard hit, uh, while more affordable class B and C uh, projects maintain very low vacancy rates. And we can see that vacancy rates should return to pre-COVID levels uh, to rebound uh, during this uh, recovery stage. For offices, when we talk about offices, um, the, uh, the highly dense uh, office market could struggle to emerge in 2022 due to uh, the, the COVID uh, constraints. Uh, this is also due to uh, the adoption of hybrid working styles uh, taken by uh, major occupiers of uh, the occupier market. Uh, the suburban offices should recover quicker, uh, and this is due to uh, fewer logistical barriers. Offices, office vacancies are, you know, they would remain high. However, positive net absorption may resume later in 2022. With regards to retail, Retail from e-commerce as tenants continue to switch their, their business models. Retail store closures are forecasted to exceed 2019 numbers. Uh, many large, we, we've noticed that many large retail store, store brands in Europe, uh, sorry, in US and in, in UK have announced closures and they're using smaller showroom space for stores as they don't see, uh, don't see the need to carry out uh, their existing inventory. One area where we are seeing particular strength is the out of town markets. And, and this has been driven by the presence of popular big box operators. They have increased demand from, and the increased demand from the discounted, sorry, discount retailers and drive through restaurants. The hospitality sector. The hospitality sector, rural and interstate hotels have performed the strongest this year. Uh, due to location and low population density areas. 
Miscade hotels uh, chains expected to recover by late 2022, followed by the upscale chains uh, from 2021 onwards. Uh, luxury chains will take longer to recover, possibly in, in 2024. To sum up, uh, what we what we like as investors, it, currently we see that uh, the industrial and the multifamily uh, products, asset products, are favorable investment opportunities. We have identified where, in fact, we have identified warehouse development opportunities in, in Chicago and a number of ventures in Europe and in, in particular the the CBD regions. We are also looking at logistic opportunities uh, in, in the UK as well. In the multifamily sector, uh, we are in final stages of underwriting two big projects, uh, with a total of about 500 uh, residential units across Texas and Arizona. We are also looking at four, a 400 multi-unit uh, scheme in, in New Jersey. And uh, in addition to all this, we also noticed that hotels uh, are selling under replacement costs, which in turn, are churning out good returns. This is something that we are monitoring very closely and to identify any opportunity, opportunistic investments. Thank you for listening and I welcome any questions at the end. Uh, over to uh, Mr. Abdul Latif. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so we have interesting, uh, we have different people from different uh, time zones and a good set of questions here that I'll go through real quick. So um, we have a question uh, about 2022 outlook for uh, commercial real estate sector. And I'll pass this on to, uh, uh, to Chris who can shed light. Uh, I would assume this is mostly uh, US real estate if you can give us your quick uh, take on that. Sure. Uh, so with regards to the, the commercial real estate, uh, so this is staggered across various asset classes, uh, as I mentioned. But then when you look particularly in, in uh, the logistics sector or the industrial sector, that currently is, is, is uh, because the demand is great, uh, is high, that is, that is uh, looking towards the most favorable asset class uh, for 2022. This along with the multifamily, uh, the multifamily sector as well. With regards to offices, it's more of the the uh, the secondary business district office uh, that is churning out demand, and is uh, and rental and rental rates are stable in those those uh, those sectors. So, in in conclusion, with with regards to the outlook, we see in in the short in the short term, in the medium to short term, that it is more of the the uh, logistic warehouse sector, the uh, office, but it's secondary uh, business district office sector and the multifamily sectors that are looking at good opportunistic uh, investments. Okay, thank you. And then another question here uh, uh, for Raghu, uh, what research does, uh, does Marmore offer? Uh, what research does one more offer? I'd like to also point out if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to type them in the Q&A section. Raghu, please. Thank you, Abdul Latif. Um, as a research company, we help uh, clients uh, with um, on the strategic consulting side, as well as on the thematic uh, research side. Uh, we focus mainly on uh, industry research, economic research, and strategic uh, research. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the region is really very uh, thin on uh, sanitized data. And Marmor has been publishing research for more than a decade, and it now sits on a huge database. And uh, we, uh, we specialize in modeling this data for clients so that we can create some very efficient future scenarios across multiple industries. So mainly our uh, you know, users are uh, big institutions, banks, asset management companies. They, they know the depth of our research and they engage us for a variety of projects. Thank you. Uh, another question for uh, Mohammed Abdelkader. Um, 
Uh, do you think the timing is right to invest in uh, GCC equities? I think you're on mute, uh, Mohammed. Yeah, I think that generally speaking, the time is good to invest in general in, in GCC equities because the uh, region somehow shares similar uh, underlying fundamentals to to a major extent. That is the uh, oil price. Then we have uh, uh, different uh, uh, countries with uh, with each characteristic or or, or uh, internal driver. But generally speaking, yes, I think. Uh, Kuwait and GCC equities should continue to do well in the in the uh, me short to medium term. Okay, thank you. And then I have a question for Khalid here. It's a long question. Uh, what differentiates regional real estate uh, compared to international, specifically Kuwait? So, what differentiates Kuwait from other real estate markets? Well, Abdullah, uh, if we want. To speak about the region, it is uh, much more underdeveloped compared to the international, especially in the US and in Europe. Uh, so, the U US and Europe, it's more mature compared to the region here uh, in the Middle East and the GCC countries. Uh, in Kuwait, we believe that the supply is limited uh, due to the nature of Kuwait and the limited number of lands in Kuwait, especially in the private residential sector. Uh, and the real estate is a, is a, is a long-term play uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and it's, it's a way to hedge from any inflation that, uh, that, that could come in the future. Uh, as far as at Marquez, uh, we manage uh, the KIA's Kuwait Investment Authority National Fund, uh, totaling for about 250 million KD. Uh, which give us a really uh, good significant advantage compared to other players. Uh, finally, uh, we, we invested in sectors before people investing in, such as industrial sector. We went in the industrial sector in Kuwait before others. Also the offices, we, we have invested in the office sector uh, while people were selling uh, uh, in the office sector. So, so, so we, we, we believe that uh, the limited number of lands in Kuwait is, uh, is, uh, would, would give the Kuwait a, a, a very competitive edge, and uh, we at Marquez take advantage of, of anything that we foresee in the, in, in the market. Okay, thank you. And then another question here for uh, Chris. What U.S. markets do you focus on, and is it too late to invest in industrial real estate? I'm assuming this is U.S., but maybe, Chris, you can also later on take us through what European markets you guys focus on. Sure. So uh, it, it's, not, it's never too late to invest. Uh, currently, what we are saying is, is just that uh, what, when you would want to enter into the market, uh, in terms of the industrial market, there is currently the, the logis uh, logistics sector, there is currently demand and there is currently a lot of development that is happening. But then when you look at the demand and supply side, there is there is a, a lot of potential scope for, for that existing supply or even the future supply to be observed. And this is because of the, the high influx of e-commerce uh, activity, because if, if you see that uh, retail, online retail has actually increased. Now, the, the markets that we, we focus on, or currently where we see our, our potential is mainly in the, the, in the South Central region, or the, let's just say the Sun Belt or the Southern Belt. That's where we see the opportunities. But having said that, we've also identified projects in Chicago as well, where we, we are actually uh, underwriting a project of a, a warehousing project in Chicago. It is uh, the next part of the question is it too late? No, it's not too late, especially in the uh, in the industrial sector, because there is a lot of opportunities, because there is there's huge demand, because there is a lot of yield compression that is happening uh, in that particular sector. But I mean, it's worth adding here, and I know our CEO, Ali Khalil, is on the call. So, I mean, when we talk about is it too late to invest in industrial, I, I can't help but, but smile because I know 
when I first joined Marquez in 2004, Marquez was already doing international real estate in the US and teaming up with large uh, fund managers doing industrial uh, real estate back in 2001, was it, with Prologis, I think. So uh, we've seen, I mean, I haven't, I can't say myself, but the team has seen the subprime, they've seen the savings and loan crisis, and it's very important to have that sort of depth when you look at real estate uh, uh, and to have that type of uh, experience. Also touching on real estate, what Khalid Nambarak you mentioned, when it came to REIT, uh, Marquez launched uh, the REIT program or the MREF and listed it on the Kuwait Stock Exchange long before there was any uh, legislation for REITs. So we have been entrepreneurs or pioneers when it comes to real estate in that particular uh, aspect. Another question here, and I'm going to give this to Raghu, the impact of rising rates on local banks. And Mohammed, also feel free to jump in. That's a very, very uh, interesting and important question to ask, because uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, increasing interest rates uh, is going to be the key risk for 2022. But uh, what would benefit, definitely banks would benefit, especially banks in the region would benefit uh, primarily because uh, many of the banks have uh, non-interest bearing uh, you know, deposits and therefore they can have a better uh, pass through of their loan books uh, when, when they have increasing interest rates. Of course, globally, uh, we have seen a trend where technology stocks get severely impacted because their earnings are far into the future. And therefore, when you discount, uh, you have a very outsized impact of increasing interest rates. But fortunately in the region, we don't have too many technology stocks listed on the stock market. So uh, I, I expect uh, banks to benefit um, a lot and especially banks with the significant uh, you know, non-interest uh, bearing deposit exposure in their books. So, but having said that, uh, we also have to figure out that this increase in interest rates is going to be a very uh, stepped up process. So it's not going to suddenly shoot up. So it will be in increments of 25 basis points that over a period of two to three years. So it's not going to happen all of a sudden. So it's going to be gradual in my view. Thank you. So another question here, does Marquez invest in foreign non-Kuwaiti startup companies or ideas to encourage them to establish local business inside Kuwait? So we've, we've helped different institutions work in Kuwait. I mean, uh, when it comes to offset obligations and the likes of GE, uh, that's a, uh, uh, in the broader text and then also when it comes to startups uh, we have worked very recently with two startups that are local uh, looking to to work regionally uh, or also cater to regional clients our advisory team has helped uh, do the valuation for those companies and then the wealth management team takes these two clients for a potential capital increase so yes we have done that uh, if this answers uh, the question. Um, one more, um, maybe maybe if we were to go through uh, the four speakers here to say, I mean, if you give me one product that, that is a good inflation hedge, maybe we start with uh, uh, Raghu probably, what, what, what do you think? A good product to invest in 2022 that could hedge inflation. Yeah, I think uh, the best inflation hedge would be commodities, especially when there is going to be a demand rebound. The commodities are a better hedge against inflation. And that's the reason why we see generally uh, uh, oil staying strong. So uh, analysts are at the moment uh, overweight on commodities on inflation fears. And uh, also the best hedge would be uh, tips. Um, which is uh, inflation protected uh, bonds. Thank you. And then, I mean, even if it, this is something, a product that uh, each of you guys is working on, please feel free to have that sort of bias it's, uh, or, or whatever you see pertinent. Chris? 
I've been extensively working on um, a lot of investment products, which is focused on, on, on the logistics and the, the multifamily um, uh, products, the asset class. So that that would be my 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 hedge or my in my opinion to invest and because we have seen the track records we've seen and we can see where that is that is going even to touch upon uh, in in the european markets where we are looking at looking at the the logistics sector because why we focus in the cee region is mainly because of 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 the geographical location and its extent and its reach to the uk markets its reach to to mainland europe and and more east into Europe. So these are strategic locations where the industrial sector is doing really well and where there is demand, uh, the drive times, uh, the easy access, the highway infrastructure that has been built to support uh, the, the logistic market is, is really favorable in these regions. And that's why we are looking at, uh, at these opportunities to, to actually tap into these opportunities and, and hopefully get good returns. Thank you. And I know you've looked at uh, Poland and Germany and that is correct. Uh, among uh, Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands, Amsterdam. among other markets, and focused on developments when others were focusing on income. You took that but early 2015-16, and I and I know you guys made the killing there. Mohammed uh, Khalid, I mean, where, where do you guys think is a good product to hedge inflation? Uh, well, Abdul Latif, as far as in the real estate department, uh, MENA real estate department, uh, we have two very interesting pro uh, products, uh, Marcus Real Estate Fund and uh, Marcus Gulf Real Estate Fund. Uh, Marcus Real Estate Fund, as you stated, is almost 20 years old. Uh, it is an income generating fund that distributes its uh, uh, proceeds from its operations to its uh, uh, investors and clients, uh, we distribute 5% uh, on annual basis, distributed on a monthly basis. Uh, it's more stable fund, it's uh, about 65 million, K, uh, 65 million KD. Uh, while our other fund, MGREF, Marcus Gulf Real Estate Fund, it's an open-ended fund, invested mainly in Saudi Arabia and UAE, and also in Kuwait. Uh, this fund uh, is currently, as I stated in, in the pres presentation earlier, uh, we, we foresee that uh, the market in UAE and Saudi Arabia uh, has recovered and the outlook uh, for those two markets uh, are really, uh, sh uh, uh, will help uh, any investments in those countries. Uh, we believe that Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE uh, a past Kuwait in terms of uh, the policies that they have uh, uh, implemented, uh, it was maybe painful at the beginning, but it's starting to pay off and it will, uh, and it's affected and will continue affecting the real estate sector. So both products are uh, excellent and uh, the choice is really hard between them. Okay. And then, Mohammed, I know you've looked at the Saudi product, I mean, seven or eight years ago with portfolios focused on Saudi where you guys had conviction long back. I mean, in terms of inflation, any, any particular uh, product that you would uh, push more than others? Generally speaking, they are all, all the same. We kind of equity would have different reaction to the inflation. Uh, a different sector would have also a different impact. The inflation would have a different impact on different sectors. So in, in, we're trying to manage that accordingly, but we don't have a specific per se uh, product to, gener to uh, hedge against the inflation. So we try to ride the uh, cycle along with the uh, best possible picking, uh, stock picking that we can generate. Okay, thank you. And then uh, another question here, uh, we're gonna wrap up soon. Then this may be Khalid, uh, uh, Raghu, Mohammed, or even Khalid, maybe can. But I'd like to start with Raghu. Would you please comment on the effect of appointing a market maker on a stock's liquidity? Any research done to compare liquidity of companies with and without the assistance of a market maker? I mean, I can start with Marcus and tell you there's a very big difference. We appointed one uh, early, early this year, as well as for us, we do op offer that product, and uh, uh, we have been uh, shortlisted uh, to be part of the uh, 
the premier market, uh, which you need to go through a certain process for you to potentially qualify, but also something worth mentioning. Ragu, please. Yeah, I think um, uh, I'm not aware of any specific research being done to study the pre and post uh, market making scenario because it's too early. Uh, the regulations are just uh, coming in uh, for market making. But uh, I can tell you that uh, if you ask me what is the biggest pain point of GCC capital market, it's a low liquidity. Um, this has been a hindrance even for foreign investment and uh, developing market making as a, a tool uh, to improve liquidity is a hugely, hugely welcome and profitable step. So uh, I, I know we have just made a start uh, from a regulatory point of view, from a product point of view, Mohammed can comment more on uh, the, the impact, but uh, I feel uh, it's, it's a great needed step for our markets. Just to say that we have uh, currently appointed by a couple of companies to, to act as a market maker for, for their stocks in Kuwait. Uh, it has to be uh, better for the uh, overall liquidity because as a market maker, you have, you're stipulated by law to have a trading out of, uh, uh, you, you do a trade reaching 10% of the total trade of the name. So for example, if XYZ is trading at 1 million, we have to at least close in 100,000 uh, trade. So you could look into an, an uptick into liquidity and there's also an additional benefit in the market. So in, uh, beside liquidity, we have in, in many names, we have a huge spread between the bid and the ask prices, which also the market maker should help in bridge that gap would, would translate into better overall market activity. So it it's goes both ways, whether it's about the number of trade or the volume of trades uh, happening on, on particular share and also the, the bridging of the uh, bid and ask, which sometimes has, could go up to two or two, 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 three percent, which is significant on, on the overall mandates we have and uh, every investor. Great. I mean, uh... Just to wrap this up, thank you everyone uh, for, for uh, attending. We've had an exceptional uh, turnout. Uh, you could get a survey by email, please, if, if you get a chance. It would help us improve for uh, uh, future uh, events. Uh, should, you, should you like to uh, touch base with Marquez or anyone, please feel free to go through our Instagram page, LinkedIn. Um, uh, or call us, I mean, uh, or our details are on our website, marquez.com, and we'd be happy to uh, offer our advice and uh, also give access to uh, professionals, uh, which some of them are shown here in this, in this webinar. Uh, we've got a question that I did not go through here about uh, Marmor. Just in short, what Marmor does is research. Research is something that's unfortunately not very abundant here in this region. So, I mean, you can go to Google and find uh, a lot of data when Chris is working uh, at or looking at real estate in the US, for example, he can find comps. You don't necessarily find that when you're working uh, or looking for uh, research on electricity in the region. So that's what Ragu's team does. He hires CFAs mostly. He works from, uh, uh, from Chennai, India, but works very closely in the region with local uh, experts. Uh, he helps a lot of the banks here in Kuwait and um, other institutions that uh, need data to make big decisions or, or, uh, or make strategies. So that's what, in a nutshell, what Marmur, uh, what Marmur does. does it, uh, have, I, uh, have I missed anything, Ragu? No, that's a very, very perfect description of what we do. Okay. Great. Thanks. So thank you again, everyone, for attending. Uh, always a, a pleasure to uh, uh, touch base here. Uh, wishing you a great 2022. So we've seen Omicron. There's disruption. We're ready and full of energy, ready to, uh, to take this on. We're working from different places. Chris is in London. Um, 
and, and Raghu is in Chennai, India with different time zones, our CEO is in a different time zone also, but we're all working 8 to 3.30 and of course beyond that to serve clients. So um, thank you again for participating.